second time, Cynthia Schweiner-Smith. Cynthia is co-owner of Civic Creative, a video production company she owns with her husband, Nick Smith. She is most proud of the historical film Gangster Land, a documentary style movie about the 1930s gangsters in St. Paul. That's Look, it, right there over there. It's right it's over for there. Sale. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence! What a coincidence! Simply didn't plan this. She has also worked at the Wabasha Street Cave since 1998, another coincidence. Where her work as an historical tour guide complements her love of writing history and, of course, St. Paul. Please welcome Cynthia Schreiner Smith. plugging the movie so I didn't have to. That's <laughs> what I do. <laughs> yes. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of that I have written, co-written, with my husband, uh, who is the victim of Psychic Creative. So if you have questions, there he is. Uh, and yes, my, most of my writing is uh, historical research for the Watershaw Street Cave, so when I saw the Grumpy Steves were on the list, I went, well, gosh, i got to do my home base. So <laughs> here I am. Can everyone hear Cynthia? Can you hear me? I got a big mouth, that's why I work here. Okay. <laughs> it isn't as loud as you can hear. No, no? Do you want to just get closer to it? Maybe. Maybe. Get up there. Good enough. How's that? Can you hear me? Okay. So, with my 10 minutes, I thought I would read two things, uh, one of which is uh, a slightly different version than one of my stories that is in the book. It just is a little bit longer, so I kind of wanted to to get that one out there. The short one is in the book if you wish to look at it later. And uh, this one is called Growing Up on Beaver Lake. In 1962, when I was seven, my father announced that we were moving since our family had grown too large for our small home in Dayton's Bluff. He had not consulted my mother and certainly had not asked any of his five kids for their opinion. The house he bought was on Case Avenue, way far away just inside the eastern border of St. Paul. When people heard where we were moving, they questioned my father's sanity. Why do you want to live way the heck out there in the middle of nowhere, they'd say. For heaven's sakes, it'll take you over 15 minutes to get downtown to work. <laughs> I was sad to be moving far away and leaving my friends, and indeed, by my inner city standards, it was almost like living out in the country. Just outside our front door was Beaver Lake a small body of water with a wild, untamed shoreline. The eastern border of St. Paul runs right through that lake. On the other side, you could see the exotic new suburb of Maplewood, a place populated mostly by farmers and a few industrious eggheads who worked at 3M. But the new house was awesome. We had a white picket fence around a big yard. It had three whole bedrooms. It was stucco. It was pink. A pink stucco house, just like the movie star Jane Mansfield. I found out years later that my brother was not as thrilled with that color as his younger sisters. In high school, he'd have his, bu his buddies drop him off blocks away and then walk home so none would discover his humiliation of residing in a pink stucco house. But living on Beaver Lake was the best part of our new home. The gnarled old trees around the shore made for great climbing. A gully leading to the lake brought out our inner evil Knievels as we flew across it on our bikes. In winter, we'd ice skate and sled down the big hill, sailing out onto the ice. In summer, we fished for bullheads, carp, and sunnies. The dense lakeside foliage provided a veritable buffet. Cherries and plum trees, wild boysenberry, strawberry, and raspberry bushes. There were even hazelnuts that we ate and ate until we were as green as the raw nuts. After snacking outside all day, we'd go home to a nice roast beef and mashed potato dinner Mom had slaved to make. She never could figure out why we didn't eat much supper. Perhaps, to make up for Mom's frustration, we'd sometimes walk to the swamp on the northern shore to pick cattails and milkweed pods. We'd glue them onto long playing records along with some macaroni, spray paint it silver, and give Mom the coolest gift ever. The wildlife included animals you never saw on Dayton's Bluff, skunks, muskrats, salamanders, and true to its name, Beaver Lake was home to several beavers. We had a great time watching them build their dams. One day, my older sister decided to wade into the lake to get a better look. She found out the hard way that the lake was also home to some very hungry leeches. 
As the city caught up with us, the growing population around the lake demanded improvements. The swamp of cattails and milkweed was dredged and replaced with a little beach. The gully was filled, trees were cleared, and the bushes of tasty fruits and nuts were replaced with fresh sod. The wildlife fled when its habitat disappeared, and now there are no more beavers in Beaver Lake. Today, Beaver Lake is a beautiful, safe, family-friendly area that St. Paul should be quite proud to have in its wonderful park system. But the kid in me, to paraphrase Bob Dylan, will always be glad that I got to grow up in the untamed jungle of East St. Paul. So of course, since I do most of my writing researching history, uh, mainly of St. Paul, my other story um, is historical. And it is called, What St. Paul Owes to Whiskey. During an 1883 visit to St. Paul, the great Mark Twain observed, how solemn and beautiful is the thought that the earliest, pioneer civil, the earliest pioneer of civilization, the van leader of civilization, is never the steamboat, never the railroad, never the newspaper, never the Sabbath school, never the missionary, but always whiskey. Such is the case. Mr. Twain was right. Such is the case with St. Paul, which grew up around a wild and woolly little tavern known as Pig's Eye Pandemonium. The tavern keeper was Pierre Pig's Eye Perrant, a cantankerous old French-Canadian fur trader of dubious morals and character, whose favorite hobby seemed to be keeping the soldiers at Fort Snelling as drunk as possible. Perrant had one squinty blind eye surrounded by a pinkish color, giving him a piggish expression to his, his sodden, low features. So they took to calling him Pig's Eye Perrant. Perrant and other squatters had been living within Fort Snelling, but the commander, Major Joseph Plimpton, got so fed up with this motley bunch that he kicked them out, twice. The second time, Plimpton burned down their house just to demonstrate he was serious. Undeterred, Pig's Eye set up his whiskey still just outside the fort on the banks of the Mississippi in what is now the lower town area of St. Paul. In 1837, the whiskey bottles were uncorked in Pig's Eye Pandemonium, and the wild little town that would become the city of St. Paul was accidentally born. Since the town had not actually been planned, no one bothered to name it. But Pierre Perrant was very infamous up and down the mighty Mississippi, and the town soon became known as Pig's Eye Landing. A few years later, Father Lucien Gaultier came to town to build its first church. In his dedication speech, he implored the young city to change its colorful but dubious moniker. And so the town was renamed in honor of a more respectable establishment, Father Gaultier's church, St. Paul the Apostle. James Goodhue, St. Paul's first newspaper editor, declared, Pig's eye, converted thou shalt be like Saul. Arise, and henceforth, St. Paul. Perhaps Mr. Goodhue was relieved he didn't have to name his newspaper the Pig's Eye Pioneer Press. <laughs> as Mr. Twain stated, St. Paul was founded on the power of whiskey, but its status as political center was nearly lost until once again whiskey and a wily Frenchman came into the picture. St. Paul had been the capital of the territory, but some wanted it moved elsewhere when Minnesota became a state. Territorial Governor Willis Gorman especially hated St. Paul, due to political disagreements and a bit of greed. He was determined to make the capital St. Peter, where he happened to own a lot of land. Governor Gorman nearly got his way. In 1857, the territorial legislator passed a bill making St. Peter the new capital, but the governor had not counted on Representative Jolly Joe Roulette, another colorful French fur trader who happened to love St. Paul and he also happened to be the lawmaker in charge of bringing that bill to the governor to sign. Instead, Jolly Joe and the bill disappeared. Legend says Joe snuck into a local hotel where he partied for days, eating fine foods and getting rip-roaring drunk. By the time he emerged, the legislative session was over and it was too late for the governor to sign the bill. Not wanting to wait two more years for the next session, Minnesota accepted statehood in 1858, and St. Paul became the capital by default. So the next time you're in St. Paul enjoying a fine drink, raise a toast to two colorful Frenchmen and the power of whiskey. <laughs>